Hank, Hank it is um, 1.15. I, I, I think we can get started a little. Yeah, we can start. Yes, yeah. please. So, okay. I, so, well. Uh, we all will have, we have had a good um, lunch. Uh, for those who have had lunch or dinner, for those who are already, you know, from the northern part of Europe. And um, uh, it's a coffee, maybe people in Britain, other places. So the next session, it is um, session four. They will all will be in the one, in one room, in the main room. The theme is Town Leaders Global Network Roundtable. The topic, specific topic is linking sustainable housing and finance as a paradigm to achieve the SDG sustainable development goals. This session will be moderated by the Secretary General of Network for European Metropolitan Religion, Regions and Areas, Metrics, that is Mr. Henk Bowman. He is the Secretary General of Metrics, as mentioned, with the 51 member organizations all over Europe. Since his appointment in 2016, yeah, he has been building out the network and he is instrumental in developing the new metrics focus groups and portals to reach out beyond the network. He has also been working, collaborating with both the Urban Economy Forum and World Urban Pavilion and linking up with a lot of, lot of mayors. You know, when I had the opportunity to have a very interesting discussion with him during the World Urban Forum in Katowice a few months ago. Okay, here you are, uh, Henk Bowman. The floor is yours and the show is yours. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Christian. Indeed, my name is Henk Bowman. I'm Secretary General for Metrics. Uh, good thing to notice is that we are growing. So we have now 54 members, it's amazing. Um, um, I would like to uh, also give my greetings from Jakub Mazur. Uh, he is, I don't know if he's here, but at least he has, he been, here. Uh, yeah. Yeah. He has been joining also other meetings uh, already. Um, we are both here then in that sense, that's very good. Um, I would like to thank the organization that we, that we can join this because it's, I think a very interesting, again, a very interesting uh, uh, session a very interesting uh, conference uh, with, of course, a very important topic also when it comes to our network. Um, we are a network, as I said, um, about 40, 54 members. We cover something like 150 million inhabitants. And we exchange on knowledge uh, and experience, but of course, we also try to support capacity building. And that's maybe something that um, that is also maybe linked to this topic, um, linking sustainable housing and finance as a paradigm to achieving the SDGs, uh, because that's exactly um, let's say one of the most difficult things. Um, we talk often about these topics in let's say separate uh, uh, sessions or separate uh, meetings, etc. But to to integrate them, to really combine them, that's another thing. Uh, we have been talking in the UEF forum. Uh, with people from the uh, from from let's say the financing world in also in our authorities but also from the european investment bank also there we can see that let's say this integrated thinking is easily said but it's not so easily done um, so that is something i think that is very important for us to also support let's say uh, cities and, and regions in, in in their capacity to really link uh, in the sustainable housing and the rates how to finance that so in that sense, I'm very, uh, I'm very much looking forward also to the speakers. We have a fantastic list, um, and um, there are, um, was it uh, Cory Dimano, mayor of the town of Banff, Banff, if I pronounce well, Alberta, Canada, is here. She is my first speaker on the list. Um, I would like to give the floor to you. Um, please introduce yourself and also take care. We have, uh, I was very much, what's it pointed out by the organization that we are limited in time. So please also. Keep your time. Uh, Cory Dimano, please, the floor is yours. Hi, Hank. Thank you very much for introducing me. Thank you for having me to here today. I'm very excited to share with you a little bit about the beautiful place I get to call home. And it's been my privilege to be the mayor of Banff. So I'm going to start my clock. Most of you may have heard of Banff, but just to give you a bit of context, we serve about 4 million visitors a year in our national park. We are a UNESCO World Heritage Site. And even though we serve such a large population, we have a resident base of about 9,000 people. Our land here is, it's a model of, uh, oh, sorry, could you go to the next slide? <laughs> Thanks, Alex. Uh, our uh, land base is leased, so we lease from the federal government. And we do have eligible resident requirements here. So in order to live in Banff, you need to work in Banff. We also have a commercial growth cap. 
So we have a fixed boundary and if we're seeing any kind of development, it's redevelopment here. And of course, like most tourist destinations, we have had challenges since incorporation, which was 1990 with available and affordable housing for the folks who live here. So if I could go to the next slide, we have been talking about housing for a very long time in Banff. We've been studying it. As you can see here, there are several different studies that we've done on it, but the big ones for us were in 2012 and 2014. And those two have really guided the work that's been done today. And within especially the 2014 Banff Community Housing Strategy, uh, we have put to work in five key areas that I will tell you about uh, in a moment, but some of the key findings from the community housing strategy were that land is king here in Banff and we have very little of it. So this is a strategy document that aims to bring us all together that housing is a problem for the whole community to work at. It's not just going to be the town of Banff as a municipality trying to uh, solve some of our issues. We also all agreed that data is important for accountability and decision making. And we also saw that rental units and barrier free units were underrepresented in Banff. So if we go to the next slide, I'll tell you a little bit about our Banff Housing Corporation, which was started in the 90s. And really uh, this enabled a lot of families to stay in town in the 90s when we started to see our school system numbers decreasing. And that was because families were leaving because it was unaffordable to buy homes. So there's about 180 family units in home ownership within this portfolio. And then we also have a rental portfolio here as well. And then just back to the Banff Community Housing Strategy on the next slide. As I said, we had about 63 specific actions, but five key theme areas through this strategy. And the approach has really been based on, you know, partnerships, collaborations, education and advocacy, policy frameworks, affordability and housing development. And again, land acquisition and availability of land, those are our biggest challenges given our fixed land base. But just to focus a bit on the regulatory and policy framework, we have through this strategy done lots in terms of looking at parking requirements so relaxing parking for apartment housing we've done all kinds of incentives to shift to mode shift so we have e-bike rebates we have studded tire rebates we've enhanced our transit access and routes we've improved trail and pedestrian infrastructure and again we are promoting barrier free design and on the next slide is an example of what happens when we have all three levels of government working together. So we were able to acquire the land here at a discounted rate from our friends at Parks Canada. And then the town of Banff built this. So this is uh, 130 units of rental. And then the province came in with a $12 million grant to help fund the construction. So we were able to reduce rents further. And now this project actually makes money and that money goes into our community housing reserve, which helps uh, with future housing projects. Right now we have another one underway. It's at cost. It's called the Aster and uh, they will be home own, they will be entry level home ownership uh, units, which we're really excited about. But so just to give you a sense um, of some stats in Banff, right now we're sitting at a 0% vacancy rate. We were starting to see some movement there at about 1%, but then the pandemic hit and uh, we don't have the current number, but we believe we're back to about zero. And 53% of Banff residents rent compared to 28% in the rest of Alberta. And then I'll just go to the last slide with my 10 seconds left here. Um, happy to chat further with anybody about Banff and housing and what we do here, but really uh, just wanted to end on a note talking about within council's own strategic priority action plan, you know, we continue to look at facilitating and managing price reduced rental and purchasable housing. We're encouraging our partners to share information and gather data with us. And we are also really facilitating public consultation activities to better understand the types of housing that uh, folks currently want. So again, uh, thank you for the opportunity to participate uh, in this important discussion. And I look forward to learning more and sharing more during the Q&A. Thank you.
Hello. Can you hear me now? Yes. Ah, okay, because it was muted by the host. Sorry for that. Thank you very much, um, um, uh, Corey. I mean, that was that was an interesting story, and especially when you said that a housing project like that beautiful uh, example you showed is actually making money and bringing, let's say, money back to the wider community. That's, I think, a fantastic uh, example, um, and, the, and maybe also how it should be. Uh, the next speaker is David Downey, the president and international downtown association in Washington, USA. We have uh, we have had visitors from your. Uh, uh, regional council actually over to our Amsterdam conference only a month ago. So happy to see you here uh, and uh, please take the floor. Thank you very much, Hank, and uh, an absolute pleasure to be here today. Hopefully I'm coming through uh, loud and clear. Uh, you know, in my short three minutes, what I what I would really want to emphasize are, are two points, and that would be um, ways in which uh, throughout North America in particular, we're focused on addressing housing at all levels. And then really from the financing perspective, it is that multi-layered cake, if you will, um, the multitude of partnerships and financial uh, instruments that are needed to make all projects pencil out. Um, in the U United States alone, uh, we have a shortage of housing to the tune of 3.8 million units, both resident, uh, both uh, rental and, uh, and for purchase. And so it is, it is a, a dire need in the US as it is all around the world. Um, Three, three areas in particular, our members are public-private partnerships that help manage downtowns and, and towns um, across North America. And we have partners um, like, the, uh, like those in Scotland and the UK that also do business improvement districts, community improvement districts. But three in particular that I would call everyone's uh, maybe further investigation towards, you know, Reno, Nevada, as well as its adjacent uh, municipality, Sparks and the surrounding county. You know, they're, they're striving to address the unhoused, a significant challenge in their region, which they uh, came together. And I think the story here is the community came together, uh, both all of the service provision uh, civic groups, both municipalities, the county agency or regional agency, and funding from the federal government to target solving the unhoused population, both in an area called the Nevada CARES campus, which is for the unhoused sheltered on a daily, uh, on a nightly basis. They focus on transitional housing through our place. And Hope Springs is a service uh, housing complex with wraparound services for those who are uh, challenged by mental health and substance abuse issues. But the story here is the partnership between government, the private sector, and uh, and the civic organizations that work together to target a solution for the community as a whole around the unhoused. The next area that I found interesting amongst our members was uh, the Paramore neighborhood in Orlando, Florida. We don't, we have uh, housing challenges everywhere, but the Paramore Asset Stabilization Fund was an initiative uh, between the NGO Foundation, the Florida Community Loan Trust, and the New Jersey Capital uh, Community Capital Bank that sought to say to understand how can we purchase uh, at a total of 1.9 million dollars, 44 different properties that had gone into disrepair, build a, a partnership organization to not only reconstruct and improve the inhabitants, but to build services for uh, low income and moderate income families who would then occupy the housing begin to uh, develop further financial life skills, and in the end, were given options to purchase their properties. You know, again, it was this partnership and this uh, variety of uh, financial instruments that made this possible. And yet it continues to move up the, um, the housing scale, even looking at workforce housing, or what I might consider missing middle housing for those even uh, at the 80th percentile of uh, average median income. In particular, coming out of COVID, we're all looking at what is the future of work? What is the opportunity for utilizing or for leveraging underutilized space, be it office facilities or former buildings, to look at conversion opportunities? We are seeing a good amount of headway being made in places like Calgary, which is now offering from a municipal fund $75 per square foot to convert 
underutilized offices to other housing opportunities. Yet another example of where we need both private sector and the public sector to help make the projects pencil out. But we're also looking at the US side on how we might get the federal government to consider other forms of uh, tax credit to enable the conversion of um, older buildings, not necessarily historic in nature, but just underutilized to begin to address this significant need. So again, my real message is, I think we need a multitude of financing tools, and we know that housing is going to be a community-wide partnership initiative, which has no single silver, silver bullet solution, but really will be somewhat unique to every community that is addressing it, much as we've already heard uh, with regard to that. Thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, that it also sounded straight from my heart, I must say. And so it's interesting to see that you address what you call your unhoused uh, people, let's say, and, and also look at partnerships and also build services. So not only, let's say, house them, but also indeed uh, make sure that they, that, that, let's say, they are sort of uh, embraced more that's by, by services uh, to also really come further in, in the world. Um, and indeed, finance, 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 that is something we will talk about later. But that's, of course, um, we, we need, of course, also intelligent ways to, to, to how to finance this and how to sort of bring this to that's uh, those local communities, but that's something also for the discussion, maybe. I would I would like now to go to uh, Phil Prentice, uh, Chief Officer of Scotland Towns Partnership from Edinburgh, Scotland. He was here, and I think he's still here. Phil. Do we miss? Ah, there he is. Thank you. Of course, you're Phil. Me. Thank you. Um, welcome from Scotland, everybody. It's great to be back amongst friends. Uh, I'm going to tell you a wee bit about what Scotland's doing in terms of housing, finance, and linking to sustainable development goals. As a nation, Scotland is predominantly made up of towns, and Banff, Corrie, is one of those towns, a medieval town in the north of Scotland, so you've stole one of our towns, um, and small cities. Uh, we do welcome participation in the ongoing Collingwood Habitat and Towns World Summit. And we commend the UEF for actually keeping politicians in the sector focused on these really critical issues. So I'm going to outline now how housing and finance can link to the UN's sustainable development goals, in particular those relating to inequalities, fair work and economic growth, sustainable cities and communities, and climate action. In Scotland, we have what's called the National Performance Framework, and that localizes the SDGs. We have 11 key outcomes, I'll not go through them all, but it is things like we live in communities that are inclusive and part of resilient, safe, are creative and vibrant. We have diverse cultures and uh, they're expressed and enjoyed widely. We have globally competitive entrepreneurial inclusive economy. We value, enjoy, protect, enhance our environment. Uh, we are open, connected and make a positive contribution to the world. However, unfortunately, like many economies, for too long we've been developer-led and very formulaic. We've created clone towns, low quality, ubiquitous sprawled housing. Towns have been hollowed out, town centres, communities have become marginalised, and the economies become extractive. In the 1980s and 90s, seen a, a, a growth of retail within our town centres, which really dominated all of the development. And now that we see the pressures on retail as people move to online or out of town, uh, there is a lot of angst and anxiety about what we do with the space within. So to help counter this at pace, the Scottish Government has been developing some new policy approaches. And I believe if, if these are delivered successfully, they could link housing and finance to the delivery of our national outcomes and ultimately the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. I'm looking at this through the lens of our towns and city centres. We recently published a new policy for uh, Scotland, a new future for Scotland's towns. The simplicity, I think, is something that's important to look at uh, in all of this. Number one, embed towns and town centres more aggressively into the planning policy uh, and all the other relevant strategies, make better use of data, be more efficient with your data collection and uh, analysis. Secondly, rebalance the fiscal environment. For example, in Scotland, if you build a new house on a greenfield site, it's zero rated for VAT, you don't pay any value added tax, whereas in the city centre you would pay 20%. That 20% is, is often the developer's profit or the margin, so if we actually look at fiscal policy, there's a lot of incentive that could happen. Digital sales tax, moratorium out of town, carbon tax and development, and a review of uh, non-domestic rates to incentivize bricks and mortar businesses over online extraction. 
provide sustained, thirdly, provide sustained and substantial long-term resourcing. So through the Scottish Government's Place-Based Investment Fund and the Scottish National Investment Bank, we are looking at five years worth of continued uh, multi-annual year settlements to the municipalities to actually start doing these things with confidence that they have multi-annual settlements to do some of the bigger, more complicated things. The UK government is also encouraging this agenda through its levelling up agenda, and we are all encouraging more housing in our town and city centres. The 20 minute neighbourhood, denser developments to reduce abnormal costs, less car parking, so we'll have pool cars, EV, more digital infrastructure, upskilling, community wealth building and community ownership and, and better ownership from municipalities as well. So we're seeing progress. The new national planning framework has embedded towns within the, the planning system. The national strategy for economic transformation talks to towns as does housing to 2040 and the climate and sustainability strategies. So we've been working closely with the Futures Trust. It's an organization that actually does most of the infrastructure investment on behalf of government, schools, hospitals, roads, digital, and so on. And they've done a deep dive into the market analysis. In Scotland, we have got a uh, a problem in that our demographic is aging. It's aging faster than most of Europe. So we've got lots of old people. We also have Generation YZ who really don't want the whole traditional mortgage thing. So it's trying to find products around mid-market rent, pay to play, allowing that younger generation to sort of be more agile and, and, and flexible. We've got issues with our short-term lettings market. Uh, it's sort of got out of control. So we've got like places like Amsterdam, etc. global uh, issue whereby Airbnb, Microsoft and lots of these big global corporates have basically come in and bought up a lot of the property stock and we need to find solutions to that. So a lot of policy at play just now to, to, to create control zones and to manage all of this. But on the ground, we're starting to see progress. Local authorities and institutional investors are starting to take a more long-term patient approach to capital investment. And in an uncertain world, all of a sudden investing in our town and city centers, particularly around housing, now seems to look very attractive. What we have to learn from what we've done so far in terms of pilots and initial um, project investments. We need to target blocks. We need to do it at the economy of scale level. We need to assemble sites more aggressively, use compulsory purchase where we, we, we need to. Be on the front foot, be proactive, facilitate the demolishing retail footprint and have mixed uses ready to come in for that. Think about biodiversity in the environment and also local supply chain making sure that the wealth keeps in the local economy. So use local construction companies, use local people to be employed in that sector, upskill, make sure that there's stronger and shorter supply chains and all of it. It's not perfect. Uh, for example, the current rent freeze in Scotland, we've got a, a global rent freeze, does not help the social uh, sector. They have a predicated business model that looks to three to 4% uplift in, in, in rents every year and that allows them to come up with investment plans so we need to work through some of the complexities but I think if we can actually lift this agenda develop housing solutions in the heart of our town and city centres do it with the right type of private investment the right type of public investment then we can actually realise some of our net zero ambitions we can create wealth we can create community we uh, bolster the economic situation as well so I'm glass half full with this. I think there's a lot of positive movement. It just needs the politicians to make the right decisions and to allow us to unleash the potential within our town and city centres. Back to you, Hank. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Phil. That was indeed a very clear story, uh, glass is half full. And that's also, I think, a good uh, expression. Um, it's interesting to see that indeed you you uh, you mentioned a lot of tools that there are, um, but I think you also mentioned the word simplicity, and I think that's something also for let's say towns and cities communities to be to be uh, let's say assured that that also these uh, layers of government these authorities can also understand let's say what what to do, and then that, then it's good I think that there is indeed something like this Scotland Town Partnership that there are people uh, there to help uh, also these communities. So thank you very much. Um, we now move on to uh, the mayor of Bandar Kamir in Iran, uh, Javad Mahmoudi. Mahmoudi. I thought he was here, but he may have stepped out with some uh, technology. I see, I see here. Uh, I see him here on my screen, but he's. He is here. He's muted. Someone needs to unmute him. He's okay. muted. Uh, I don't see him yet. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. There's the problem. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. Uh, 
Thank you, dear Hank, for moderating the session. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Jawad Mahmoudi from Iran, Bandar Khamir. I'm in Europe, Bandar Khamir in the south of Iran. And I want to have a review on what happened on housing section in the city uh, as a small city in Iran. But I want to share my presentation as well. Uh, I wanted to do it myself, but I don't know if it's possible or not. Uh, okay. You, you can try now, Matt Moody. Yeah. You can see my presentation? Not yet. Not? It's downloading. Ah, there, there it is. is. Okay. I have to wait. You're okay. Okay. You can, you can, you can, you can see? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, sorry. I have to stop once first. Okay, I go to the first page of. Uh, I want to have an uh, introduction of the city very quickly. A city with uh, 2,000 population in the south of Iran, next to the Persian Gulf, and close to Arabic countries. And uh, they, there, is, so there are similarities with the, uh, those countries in weather and in uh, architecture and culture. Uh, but uh, the main feature of the city is that the city is uh, located behind uh, of, uh, a very big wetland in the uh, marine wetland that is the largest marine wetland in the Middle East with, uh, that covered with the mangrove forest. So the city has ecological position and situation. Uh, the city has been selected as a world wetland city uh, this year in the Ramsar Convention, the first Iranian wetland city. And also uh, because of uh, our attempts uh, for educating our people to uh, raising their awareness about the wetlands and about the national and environmental phenomena, we selected as UNESCO level city. So we had two uh, world title and the city is so important for uh, how we can have a sustainable development in small cities in Iran. But in aspects of uh, housing and how we can develop our, our, our city, because our city naturally located between the mountains and the sea and the wetland. So they are limited to, to grow in the north and in the, in the south. And also on the, in the two sides, west and east, we had the industrial areas that uh, restricted our city to grow. So the first challenge of our city is the limited residential area and we don't have enough lands for building new house. So uh, consequently, the uh, more people and uh, individuals and person live in the uh, old areas of, of city and we have a high population density. And also uh, most of the people try to shrink their houses uh, to, to, to make, to, to build the new houses for their children, for the new generations. And also we have a high crops of land because of the limited amount of lands in the city. We have an unusual price in the city. So our solution is uh, our, our solution is to uh, using the maximum cap capacity of our lands in urban area and, or, and how we can prepare them for building new houses. The first solution was how we can use all the lands that were predicted for, for making, for building house. We had many lands that, well, that uh, had uh, legal problems and then locked because they couldn't use for building a house. We try to release them and make them free for building houses. So we succeed to uh, release all of them uh, about 100 hectares. So, and it is uh, added to 
our capacity for building new houses. Uh, the second solution was how we can add more lands to the urban area to uh, build house sustainably. Uh, we add a lot of lands uh, that was close to the city, close to the urban area uh, in that you can see in the picture, the green area that we added to urban area for uh, developing our residential areas. But the second challenge was uh, the extremely high cost of building a house because of uh, a very big uh, inflation that we had in Iran, you know, the most of people couldn't uh, build the new house for themselves or for their children or for their family. So everyone who want, want to build the house, he, 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 he has a very difficult uh, conditions around them and they couldn't uh, make it usually. Uh, because of this, uh, expense of uh, the building we have uh, increasing in the house rents and also we don't have enough uh, houses for rent for people because most of people uh, against of uh, building a house uh, prefer to rent a house so there, there, there is a problem for finding new houses for rent and also most of people couldn't cannot make a new house and they forced to live in the old houses and, uh, and in the result the most of the people use the building more and more and more and is the faster deterioration of the buildings and houses and also we have uh, the problem of forming some inefficient and unauthorized settlements around the city that is a very dangerous uh, phenomenon that uh, because the people need shelters and they, it's, it's the basic uh, needs of anyone. So they uh, try to have a very informal, uh, non-formal uh, houses. But our solution was how we can provide and suggest some financial solution and support for the people by using the capacity of government or public organizations. The first solution was uh, we, as a municipality, we had an agreement with the, the largest relief foundation in Iran, how we can build some small houses for vulnerable people that are more on, on the more pressure uh, against of, uh, uh, on, in compare with other people. So we uh, built uh, 100 houses in three years, re re the, uh, five square meter houses, very small houses for vulnerable people. And uh, <clears throat> we use the capacity of government that they had a plan to uh, building a house for the, 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 the youth and the uh, people that, that they don't have house, the national housing movement, the, this um, plan uh, suggests free lands and uh, provides free lands for people and a suitable mortgage and we can, they can uh, uh, have uh, a house. The, second the third solution was how we can support some cooperatives that are active in housing fields. Uh, they, uh, build and deliver houses with suitable financial conditions for the applicants and most of them uh, are employees. And the fourth solution was how we can uh, repair and restore the, the old uh, houses in the historical and old part of the city, how we can uh, revival them and, and make them for using more and more and more. This was the so a quick review on what happened in uh, sustainable housing and finance in Bandar Khanu. Thank you so much for your kind attention. Thank you, Javad. Um, that, that was, I think, quite interesting uh, to see that also the city, a relatively small city, is investing so much time and attention and money in, in really improving, let's say, the housing conditions for also the more vulnerable people in, in your city. 
that's great to see um uh, but also there i think it needs financing as you mentioned uh financed by also the national government but also the, what is the foundation uh, those things um, might indeed be even more necessary uh, and might improve have to improve to make it even even more possible to, to uh, for, for more people um finally i would like to go to Emmanuel Kechetukwe. he's from nigeria um metro max international and the river state chapter of nigerian institute of town planners so please emmanuel uh, take the floor and um and tell us what what the situation is uh in your region Greetings, everyone. Thank you, Metrex, for a kind introduction and the uh, beautiful remarks. I want to thank the uh, speakers that have laid the background on the topic under review today, sustainable housing and finance. Uh, housing is at the center of the delivery of the sustainable development goals. And it is an unarguable fact because where you have sustainable housing, it takes care of a number of issues that revolves about sustainable development. But sustainable housing cannot find its grip without the provision of adequate finance instruments. Uh, I want to take you, I have a number of slides. I don't know if uh, I'll be able to share my slides. Would that be possible? That should, that should be possible, certainly. Please go ahead. Okay. okay. There it is. You might want okay. to go to full screen and then we can see it very well. All right. So I try to link sustainable housing and finance, the concept of urbanization, uh, sustainable development, and then looking at the estimated population growth of UN with the bulk of this growth to take place in Africa and Asia. And now sustainable housing transcends uh, addressing housing with a view to making it affordable, but it also tried to ensure that those of the low income and middle income, income band are able to participate in this without actually being uh, disabled to continue with other aspects of their life. And I tried to draw from the Nigeria example here in uh, Nigeria, finance has been one of the bane to sustainable housing in Nigeria. Now, looking at the statistics of Nigeria, the biggest country in Africa, estimated annual population growth of 2%, annual urban population growth rate of 4%. And uh, as at uh, 2020, we were having uh, we're having over 52% urbanized population. And our housing deficit as at present is 17 million units. And Nigeria has in place robust national housing policy among other instruments geared to promote uh, sustainable housing. But all to no avail, what are the major challenges? Now, some of the challenges we have absence of access to low cost funding, who we'll have a high lending rate and misrising inflation, weak legal framework, inadequate housing supply, undercapitalized mortgage banks, affordability issues. Even when these houses are provided, the targeted population cannot assess them. Mm -hmm. Unregulated urban land markets, the, the urban land market is both the formal and informal, and the informal tend to have more control than the formal. So that takes the prices of land to a very uh, 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 a high top, so that by the time you acquire the land 
and put up any development, including cost of construction, the prices of the houses that are supposed to be, that attempt low cost housing are beyond the cost of the low income earners and the middle income earners. We also have the challenges of urban informality, which is also as a result of lack of access, access to finance. You find the urban poor now moving to settle in environmental sensitive areas. Now, what are the government interventions? Government has intervened in the area of low cost housing scheme and national housing fund is one of the fund through which the Federal Mortgage Bank, which is the main instrument of financing housing development and mortgage finance loans that the country utilizes. But at the end of the day, we are still, the housing deficit is getting wider by the day amidst ghost estates in the country. Now, most of the private estates you see, beautiful houses, no occupants, all because of issues of affordability. People cannot afford the houses. Now, housing in Nigeria, what are the challenges? Looking, looking at it, why are we, where are we, where we are? Now, in terms of building, our building construction materials have remained concrete block and mortar. And most of the materials we buy for our finish, we use for our finishings, they are imported. So at the end of the, the day, all this contributes in increasing the cost of housing construction. And it also affects the rental value of the houses. So all this put together, you see that even when you are able to assess the loan to construct the buildings, it could not achieve the purpose for which those loans were made. Today in Nigeria, the interest rate to get housing finance from the mortgage bank is 6%. But how true, how true is this 6%? What are the assurances that at the end of the day, you'll be able to pay back these loans that spans for a period of 30 years after the first down payment of 10%? As a result today, a number of what the government tend as low cost housing have eventually ended up in the hands of the rich. Have ended up in the hands of the rich because the low income and middle income uh, any band that were targeted cannot it. Now the rich have taken over those housing estates and are renting it. Emmanuel, you're frozen. Can you just move a little, maybe, the screen? Very bad connection, I think, my friends. Are we have technology to uh, technological problem? Maybe he is trying to come back again. Okay. At least he's gone, so I think he. Um, so the discussions maybe. Yeah. If he comes back in, we'll just let him finish his presentation. Of course, because it's um, yes. quite it's it is very interesting, and of course, also a country uh, you know, two hundred and eleven million inhabitants. I mean, numbers count in in, in Nigeria. That is clear. Um, yeah, first of all, um, um, maybe are, are there any questions from, from let's say, the participants in, in, this, um, in this meeting? I see quite a number of them. Were there any specific questions, let's say, to one of the speakers, uh, maybe, that you would like to, to ask or know more about? If anyone, please take the floor. Is that possible, by the way? They can unmute themselves, I assume. You can unmute them, Hank. Okay. 
Christian has a question. Christian has his hand up. There we like go. I just wanted, I just wanted to thank uh, uh, for a very, very you know interesting person. I have two or three is sort of um, remarks or questions related to the, the speakers. When it comes to um, the the, uh, the housing situation in the U.S., um, David talked about um, repurposing conversion uh, of of uh, underused, unused houses into uh, buildings into houses, kind of a thing. Is there sort of a specific funding from the federal government, like the uh, like IRA kind of thing? Is it something that is being used for that, or how does they do the what is what is the role of financial institutions? in this respect or do the people who move in they have to pay the cash for repurposing these buildings or will they be repurposed before they move in uh, what kind of thing it's sort of um, maybe i don't know to what extent this idea of um, social housing in this context can be used uh, and then is it something that we have in uh, smaller cities or also it's a phenomenon that we're looking into repurposing after post covid situation in bigger cities as well then in the same way, I can also sort of uh, finish my questions about uh, the Scottish situation, where the, 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 they talked about the housing you know, shortage. Um, the government said they're going to about 50,000 buildings will be houses will be built and, built and kind of things. There again, what is the role of the cities, municipalities? Do they, do they, do they is any funding come from the cities? Like in the before Thatcher times, the cities, there, there were council houses that were given to uh, people who needed them. And so then they were all sold. Is a council council housing concept coming back for affordable housing schemes? Then my last question is to um, uh, Mayor Mohammadi. Uh, I understand that um, uh, the, the 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 question of linking up your city as one of these um, world uh, what should I say knowledge cities, I suppose. Yeah, is it something linked to SDGs and housing as well in that context? Uh, are you looking into uh, vernacular architecture or the knowledge cities uh, UNESCO wants your city to be is related to other SDGs. Thank you. Thank you, Christian. That, that was a whole series of questions. I hope the speakers uh, uh, took out, let's say, the question which was pointed out to them. I think the first issue was about the USA, and maybe it's David Downey who can help us in, in answering that question. Certainly, and thank you for the question. You know, I think over time there's been a, a number of, of solutions for conversions. Most re recently, we're asking our federal government to consider a tax conversion credit mechanism um, that would apply throughout all cities across the United States. That would be a federal tax incentive that would then go to the development uh, entity to assist in the conversion costs, which I think we all recognize are significant, um, especially with supply chain and inflationary uh, impacts as of late. But we have also seen historically where the same approach was taken in the late 1990s and early 2000s by the state of New York, who then provided an additional tax credit. And that led to much of the redevelopment after 9-11 in lower Manhattan converting from largely just office to a mixed use development, which I think is what we're all aspiring towards for complete communities. More recently, um, it has been the city of Calgary, having received fundings from the provincial government who are then allowing uh, for this $75 per square foot uh, financing um, offer to private development to help bring the cost of that uh, conversion down. And then we also heard a similar thing recently in the city of Chicago from simply the municipal housing fund that is trying to help finance these. I think in large part, it is some level of government which then needs to help subsidize the conversions of older buildings into, um, into new mixed uses, which also has a very strong climate uh, impact uh, uh, um, kind of grounding in its purpose. So we're not just building new. Mm -hmm. Does that also mean that uh, when it comes to smaller cities or smaller entities, do, do, do they receive, let's say, also help in finding those uh, those funds, finding those issues? Oh, now you're muted. Sorry, David, you're muted. Um, someone needs to yeah, unmute that, you. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, sorry. The, the, the system is muting, helping us yeah. in that regard. But yes. Um, for the federal program that we're advocating for would be accessible to all small towns, mid-sized cities, 
and really targets not the scale of the municipality, but really the underutilization of the individual building structure itself. Okay. Hmm. I hope that answered your question, uh, um, Christian. Um, yes, thanks. Yeah, thanks. You must help me with your next question. There was one to Phil Prentice to Scotland when it comes to the uh, estate, uh, uh, let's say the estate housing. Council that, housing. Council housing and estate housing that was in the old days. But how is it now, uh, Phil? Can you maybe? Yep. Uh, it was a big mistake to sell off the council stock. And we are, we have been on the back foot ever since. What I would say is the market across the country is not ubiquitous. It's not a homogenous thing. There are lots of towns and cities that are actually doing pretty well. So there is a, a flow of commercial investment and social investment into housing. But where the, you have subprime market, it is very difficult to get it to stack up. One of our advantages in Scotland is that we have a network of social housing providers. So again, heavily subsidized by Scottish government through affordable housing. And we also rely on the private sector. So for every time a housing development is consented, the private sector have to build 25% affordable houses. So at least we've got uh, you know, structural mechanisms to make sure there's a reasonable amount of stock moving forward. So yes, uh, Mrs. Thatcher has got a lot to answer to, but then so does the, the, the incumbents that are in just now. I don't think they're much better. <laughs> yeah, well. Indeed, and I think there was a final question also to Yavad uh, Mahmoudi uh, from Iran. Yes. Did you note down the question? Uh, yes, uh, I want to have a, an explanation about the question. Uh, the, uh, it was about the learning city, uh, as the, the question mentioned. Learning city means that the, a city try to solve their problem or their issues with uh, concentrating on learning and educating their people. Okay, it's the concept of learning city that UNESCO introduced in uh, recent years. Uh, and Bandar Hamir uh, has a, a successful background in how we can participate uh, the citizens and people in social decision making and raising their awareness about the, the, the city's issue, especially in environmental issue. Okay, because the city is a uh, very uh, sensitive ecological uh, location. Uh, but uh, we prepared a, a very uh, comprehensive plan for our uh, learning uh, strategy for, for the city for many fields, for all fields from the formal education to tourism, to sustainability, to, uh, for example, for, for, for making jobs or in something else. But in sustainability, you have some plan and program to, uh, to, to familiar our people with the, some topics in, in sustainability, in housing especially, such as uh, how we, they can use energy in, in uh, or clean energy especially or your, how, how we can improve our energy consumption in our city in our in our house or how they can use the gray water in the housing oh uh, we have many plans many programs for encouraging our people to to grow to develop the green spaces around the their houses and we had a lot of activities about that. That was about the learning city and how we can link it with the housing and uh, citizenship education. Yes. Thank you, thank you, Javad. Uh, that, that was a very clear explanation. I think a very, very clever, and very intelligent way of also um, putting this learning aspect into into the housing issue. What what I have heard a lot, let's say, uh, in most cases, is the uh, the issue about land value or let's say land prices. Which in some cases are, are let's say given by by maybe a topographic situation like in your case uh, you have the mountains and the sea let's say it is a bit constrained but in other cases also uh, where maybe uh, land ownership is an issue that the people who own the land let's say see of course a big need and um, and then uh, yeah ask the more money for it that's simply the market are there in general let's say maybe from you but also from others um, 
are there let's say ways to to tackle that um uh, are there ways to get around that because of course you know when the land is when it starts already with very expensive land um you know how do we then in the end also make affordable housing i don't know if you want to start Javi, but i think i'm also interested still in, in emmanuel because i think the story that stuck stuck with he he is back as far as i see but maybe yeah. i thought maybe you can say something about your situation that's very that's a very physical let's say constraint in a way that you that you face in the city Yes, our city, as I mentioned in my presentation, is very limited and the, 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 the topic of sustainability is very highlighted in our city, you know, because when we want to have a plan for growth, for developing our city, we encounter with some restricted laws uh, that we had in, in protected areas, especially. Mm -hmm. All of our coastline is under protected area. That the, the city is very uh, different situation from the other cities around this, the, 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 at the neighbor of the city. Our city cannot compare themselves with others. So we have to have a special plan for our city. And we try to do that. We, we try to do that when we put ourselves in a process of achieving uh, a, 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 a board title. It's, it's uh, consequently our people. Uh, notice more and more for the, uh, the, the our challenges about being at the neighbor of a very uh, uh, sensitive uh, location. Mm -hmm. So we try to do that uh, generally. Yes. Oh, okay. And, and maybe Emmanuel, you, you're back. I see um, at least in my list. Could you maybe say something because your your presentation was halfway stopped? I don't know if you want to finish it. That's of course possible. Did he now disappear again? Um, sorry for that. Uh, it is in my in my ear. It is a very bad connection, but maybe sorry, maybe you can well, close the camera. You, it might help if you turn your video off. Okay. All right. So the, the land speculators are the ones that are always at the forefront. And by the time they grab these lands, when developers come in to develop, the community will now be interested with the value, the, the amount that the land speculators are now asking from the supposed investors. And this always set in confusion in clearing the way for development to take place because you have a lot to settle families, communities, and all that. So that tenure problem is one issue that has been a bottleneck to housing development mm -hmm. in Nigeria. And even recently, the House of Assembly, they are making effort to look at the Land Use Act to see how they can unbundle some of the uh, uh, laws that they have enacted there in order to to free out lands so that people can developers can easily assess these lands at a rate that will be lower and for development at the end of the day after housing construction it will also reduce the cost of construction and make it, make it afford, affordable to low income and middle income earners are there other other examples uh, from one of the speakers or maybe someone from the audience in terms of th this is clearly an example where uh, yeah, obviously also the national government needs to do something needs to let's say create policies to to um yeah, to handle to tackle that issue but are there other examples for that because it's, it's a very basic issue of course the land uh, price and land availability so maybe something from um from washington again david downey Certainly, um, I guess I would say from, from a North America, it's less uh, natural constraints uh, to availability of land and is, is more often political decision. Um, I think one of our biggest challenges is to convey and educate the, the, the impacts of climate change, the impacts of uh, lower density development, the extraordinary cost uh, per acre 
um, is something that most municipalities are struggling with. Um, we are beginning to see, much as Phil Prentice mentioned, an understanding is of how is land being assessed uh, in a more fair uh, and equi equitable way to better understand where land value is really being driven by a uh, historic assessment model that may not be um, accurate and reflect today's needs. By example, in the 1970s, half of the population of North America um, was families with children, and the other half were adults, uh, single or couples with no children. In 2025, that's going to be closer to 75% households without children. Mm -hmm. And yet, we are 62% of our housing are single family detached residents. So just from a policy perspective and not just uh, market demand, but understanding how to make those difficult decisions in light of future projections so that when municipalities do have access to land that they either own or can acquire, that we are also equally um, comfortable making those higher density demands of the redevelopment project. Um, one area that I think has done a really nice job with their municipal owned uh, properties is if we investigate the work that's being done in Copenhagen mm -hmm. and the way in which they've been able to leverage their lands as a, as a, as a development finance tool to then bring on uh, what is needed for their community. I think that in North America, we need to be much more skillful at that as well. Mm -hmm. Indeed, it's a very good example, I think, Copenhagen, but there are more examples elsewhere, also in Europe. Um, but indeed, uh, it is sometimes even a matter of changing behavior or changing perception. And also how, how I live in France now, uh, I'm Dutch by origin. In Netherlands, it's quite, let's say, normal, or I would say, tradition to have a house, you know, house on the ground. Uh, where in France, uh, when you live in a city, you have an apartment, and that's a very sort of natural, you know, traditional thing. So there, there might also be an issue about, uh, yeah, let's say, perception, how people perceive these things, and that needs attention. And I think that was indeed very interesting also in Copenhagen, where they also addressed, let's say, the, the, the traditional culture, uh, which is, of course, a, you know, that, that takes time. That is not an easy thing to change, but they did it in, in, in some cases. Are there any more um, uh, questions, maybe, for, for the speakers or issues you would like to bring forward? Uh, Hank, I, I do see, I'm sorry to interject here, I did see that uh, Rosalind uh, Morrison had a question. Um, perhaps I'll let Rosalind ask her question herself. Mm -hmm. Okay, sure, yeah. Thanks, Alex. Um, I'm just uh, so impressed with what Scotland has done with their uh, town partnerships, Phil, and I'm wondering if you can explain to us, uh, just very briefly, um, the, uh, the catalysts that uh, brought that uh, to be, uh, what were the drivers, basically what, what, what was the uh, genesis of the Scotland Town Partnerships, which has such an inspirational and actionable actionable program with the performance uh, evaluation system as well. Yeah. Well, very briefly, uh, it, it, it came about post the world financial crash back 2008. Everybody was hanging around waiting for a recovery and it didn't come. And the politicians got into a room and started to realize, you know, we're looking at big city driven economies like London, but we don't have a London and Scotland, we're two small cities in Glasgow and Edinburgh, the rest of it's towns. So we really needed to take the whole issue of town seriously. Very complicated agenda because it involves institutional investment, it involves private and social house builders, digital culture, energy, climate. You know, how do we go about doing that? So Scottish government instructed an independent review, which was very expansive, involved all the sectors, the stakeholders, community groups, and so on, and even the voices that are less heard, often less heard. And they came up with a town centre action plan. At that point, Scotland's Towns Partnership was uh, created a sort of cross-sectoral go-to central body which everybody could trust so we're not for profit we basically build evidence and you know we've got a typology of every town in scotland based on about forty thousand bits of data to show the true form and function of these places not league tables but just basically how the, the, the place works wealth poverty who comes into your town who leaves your town every day etc so providing toolkits resources encouragement you know, building the positive message about what can be achieved, creating a network across the country, you know, a, a level of expertise, 
bringing political focus through across party group and basically just becoming trusted across all the sectors and mm -hmm. having that political focus that, that that's the key thing so the new feature for scotland's towns is the latest policy and i genuinely think if you take a look at that future towns.scot it provides a lot of the answers to a lot of the problems that have been discussed here today mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's, it's sometimes even a matter of almost depoliticizing, is it? Um, another example, but there's no one from there here, I think. But it, uh, another in interesting example to to uh, study on is what, what they've done in the Basque country, uh, where also they have a, a bit of a similar approach like in Scotland. Um, and, and indeed, their efforts have been uh, on, on building trust, uh, let's say, amongst not only population, but also, let's say, the institutional partners and, and the business sector. And that that has created let's say a sort of platform where now a lot of things are at least easier i would say and there, there is um i saw also a question that was also on to fill actually from tiffany uh and that was about the when you say developers build 25 percent affordable what does that look like 80 percent of rent 50 percent of rent it's a very specific question so you can see it in the chat box if you like And if you know. <laughs> Excuse yeah, me, Hank, I, I was also wondering. Oh, sorry, go on, Phil. No, I think I've already answered uh, Tiffany via the um, chat box. Okay, sorry. Hank, I was wondering if uh, for the 2022 resolution, if there were at least three recommendations that uh, the group could suggest. Mm -hmm. as a new resolution item or either ones that we want to move forward it's a great opportunity now yeah. that's actually one of the key things uh, to, to also achieve here of course the resolution um th there are indeed some points in the chat but uh, maybe indeed there can also be uh, of course answers in the chat and uh, you can always uh, check that they the organization and with people uh, for answers later on but indeed when it comes to the resolution um, that's of course an important thing what what would we like to achieve? You see the poll um, uh, also in your screen, which is more or less um, uh, addressing various issues uh, uh, and, and there has been voting uh, done. But are there specific things things that you have maybe not heard or that you really would like to uh, to bring forward, let's say, when it comes to, uh, to the resolution? Anyone uh, in the audience? I, I just was. Krishnan. Yeah, uh, you know, this this is something that um, may be maybe of interest, especially these days. We're talking about um, you know a um, lot of uh, dis displacement of displacement people and kind of things, which is also related to the reality of the country that uh, Emmanuel Kechuku comes from. Mm -hmm. You know, where you have you know, for example, Nigeria has nearly about uh, four to five million internally displaced displaced people. These people are internally displaced because of uh, the internal conflict. And the northeast of Nigeria from you know Borno and the Adamawa states and these places. Yeah. So they come to cities normally. They in cities that are smaller and bigger. A city is not prepared for providing houses for these uh, the newcomers. And sometimes they think, oh, we can give them tents, short-term stay, they will go back. You know, like uh, I don't think they are intending to go back anytime soon. Like practically today's uh, opinion poll of um, uh, you know Ukrainian immigrants, uh, Ukrainian refugees that came to Norway, they say. Just, just uh, less than 10% of them are expecting to go back after 10 years. Most of them would like to stay on, would stay on for different reasons. That means countries that are receiving, you know, displaced people, you know, or internally displaced in the case of Nigeria, there, there aren't any specific programs or, or financial mechanisms. Like when I was in Nigeria, we had, you know, we were looking at how World Bank eventually could support this kind of activities with the loan that given to given Nigerian government. But then again, does it really come to people who need houses? Because it also would reduce conflict between people who are already there and people who come in in search of new houses and resources. Mm -hmm. And uh, so these are things that we have to housing, not just generally in the specific context of conflict and displacement, not the least climate refugees. The housing becomes a major issue also in smaller towns and mm -hmm. cities. So this is something that this is something that we have to look into mechanisms. Could we say that COP27 should have some some sort of specific allocation of this kind of, uh, you know, uh, climate financing? Should we have something about ODA should be specifically looking at housing for displaced people? 
uh, refugees and and other conflict related people most of them are mostly women and children should be something looked into yeah it's mm. something that i think we may want to uh, somehow mention in the resolution as well i don't know if emmanuel has any comments on that thanks yeah and I, I, let's say our metrics president has left uh, for, for other reasons but uh, he's also facing he's he's a mayor of the city of Rostov in poland and they have welcomed about 300,000 refugees from Ukraine on a city that's about 600,000 in inhabitants. So can you imagine? And those things, of course, yeah, can be seismic. They can offer something to happen. But as also Christian says, sometimes it's uh, much more uh, what it, uh, uh, um, softer, uh, let's say, uh, phenomenon, you know, where, where let's say people come uh, and not maybe in such high numbers, but still uh, displaced people or, or refugees, um, how to deal with that? Because yeah. I mean, there, it's it's a huge uh, issue and it's everywhere. I remember from Brussels there is about fifty thousand people. They call them sans papier. They don't have papers. That say we don't really know them, which is on, on itself quite terrible. But um, do we need to sort of um, address that? Do we need to make sure that it is addressed also in the let's say UN and other uh, levels of policies? And I think you mentioned uh, Emmanuel um, uh, Christian. Is he still here? Yeah. Yeah, because uh, yeah. there's specific. There's a country that's the specific mm. situation that they have been facing, where they have also done some policies, which we interesting to look at how they have done it. Yeah, Emmanuel, you you are still here, so could you could you maybe uh, give your view on yeah. that? Yeah, I, I'm listening. Uh, it has been a problem, and uh, the federal government has also on its part. Be making frantic effort to address the issue of uh, internally displaced persons. And recently, the flooding issue that came up as a result of the river Niger overflowing its bank has also seen communities have been submerged. And I think one major problem we have is. Uh, uh, non proactiveness on the part of government because NIMENT, the meteorological uh, uh, institution in Nigeria here, raised the alarm about six months ago that there's going to be massive flooding beyond what we experienced in 2012. And they called on state governments to hasten up to uh, come up with uh, evacuation uh, uh, arrangements and plans, but everybody just sat back and the flood came. Today, people are staying in primary schools. People are staying and cooking along the road. Mm -hmm. And the best the government do most of the time is to come up with relief materials, which is not the, which is not the solution to risk uh, disaster risk management. So these are issues that the National Assembly also needs to ensure that we come up with policies that we can apply to set up permanent uh, camps where mm -hmm. we can take in displaced persons. And uh, I also want to quickly policies here. There is also need to enhance uh, uh, urban governance here so that people that are going into self-help in order to uh, construct houses for themselves, they should be a well planned layout for them so that this could also help to control the uh, having houses that are closely built together. And we saw the after effect at, of that during the COVID era, where social distance cannot even be applied in some certain neighborhoods, particularly the slums. So if we have an effective urban governance in place, that could also help places where you are having a self-help uh, approach so that they have their buildings in a well-organized format that is decent and also promote sustainable development. Mm -hmm. Yeah, open governance. I think that's uh, one of the key things as well. Are there are there any more? Um, I see also some discussion in the in the in the chat. Um, um, things like indeed, how do we define affordable or attainable? Um, um, I think there, there was a, the combination of so looking at services and also, let's say, supporting people. Um, so not only giving them a house, but also giving them a life, actually. 
the opportunity to develop a life to prosper. Um, is that something that that should also maybe as a sort of basic uh, element should be in the, in the resolution, or how do people see that, or are there any other um, issues you would like to raise for the resolution? Anyone from maybe the organization also? You have been thinking about it for a bit longer. Sonia has her raised her hand raised. Ah, uh, sorry, Sonia here in the top yeah, down of Hollywood. Here we are, Sonia. Thank you. I, uh, I, I, if you have time, I always find it a very interesting uh, conversation around sort of who's paying for what with respect to affordable housing, because I think it is a catalyst for the achievement of SDGs. And a number of things just keep swirling around in Collingwood. Um, one is uh, actually raised by our Provincial Association of Municipalities, which was our land, our land taxes or income taxes best suited for um, funding um, affordable housing, i.e. is this a redistribution of income or is it a redistribution of you know what you've already paid for your house? And I know that might not translate well really internationally, depending on how you know, tax paradigms, for example, might work. Uh, but that's one part of the question or one part of the, the piece what I would be interested in, in, in input on. Another part is um, uh, we have many businesses that uh, we very much value and a lot of those businesses require some people at lower middle levels to run them, of course, and this is a workforce housing session, so everybody knows that. And then I struggle a little bit with um, uh, just the public policy question around, is it those businesses and the wages that they pay uh, and thus the prices they charge the public um, that should translate into affordable housing? Or is it in fact the municipalities and other government entities or not-for-profits for that matter um, that should be filling the gap where wages can't. And I know those are impossible questions, but I think they're really important questions. Um, and I'm just wondering if anybody's done, anybody on the session has done research in this regard or has strong opinions. Thank you. Thank you, Sonia. I think that those are very good questions, good issues, maybe not so easy to answer, but Indeed, on, on your last issue, uh, of course, you, we, can, we should also not forget what, what was in the past in terms of where also businesses, let's say, developed uh, uh, housing areas. And, and there are many famous examples, I think, in the UK, but everywhere, I think, also in Europe, um, where businesses are sometimes also taking that up again. Um, and that is maybe affordable, but let's say for the whole range, because in general, you see there are quite a number of places which, which have a problem, let's say, attracting a good what is the work uh, force uh, whether it's on the higher level or, or or the lower incomes but they're all needed so is, is there indeed anyone who, who has more recently maybe been, been looking at that i can tell you that we have a fellow actually in our metrics network uh, that is doing research on that phd research so i can share that but that's not finished yet but maybe there's someone else who can say something or maybe uh, agrees on this uh, something to further develop There is an, a remark from uh, Curry Dumano, the first speaker, um, in the chat. We require our commercial sector to contribute to housing through either building or providing cash in in lieu of housing. Maybe I don't know. And there's a there's a, uh, a link as well. I don't know if you want to say anything more about that, Curry, but yes, I think there's also a link. Thank you for that. And by the way, also Alex Benuta has um, has shared, let's say, the um, the resolution text, which is on a accessible on a google page google com page so please have a look it's important to uh, to have that right to also have your input for that there's also a long remark from rosalind morrison is there something you would like to to add let's uh, say uh, just say uh, that uh, rosalind 
I just wanted to echo a um, presentation by Randy Scherzer this morning, um, excellent presentation by Gray County mm -hmm. on how to define the number of units we might need in Southern Georgian Bay using a system called the HEART system. Um, you know, affordable housing, 30% of gross household income is universal in Canada as the definition. We don't need to get confused about it. Universal because it doesn't matter if you're making 20,000 or 200,000 a mm -hmm. year. Uh, using uh, Randy's presentation on the heart system, we can figure out the data um, with the 2021 census on the number of units we actually require here as an example. Uh, the reality is we need a lot of rental units and uh, mm -hmm. it, it's really great to understand what problem we're trying to solve um, for us here in Southern Georgian Bay. Thank you. Thank you, Rosalind. Yeah, that was a good addition, I think. Anything uh, more from uh, the audience, please? Anymore? This is Dave Downey. Um, I would ah, just okay. add, add to what Roslyn is saying, um, because we too use 30% as, uh, as a marker that is universally uh, attributable. However, um, if we also look at housing plus transportation, then we also need to be thinking in terms of not exceeding 40%, which then goes to the question of how do we better make the, the small town density um, argument so that we can get the the multitude of housing in the density that's needed without pushing way outside and creating um, undue hardships, especially for the service economy to then also be available uh, with a reasonable transportation um, solution. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, David. That, that is something, by the way, where, where the network I work for, uh, Metric, is also uh, making a point in terms of um, that, that we see that uh, those those things should be addressed on a sort of metropolitan or regional level because indeed um you know you see also in the in the countries where let's say these metropolitan areas are more or less defined more formally defined uh there you see at least uh, better policies uh, in place but on the other hand sometimes you see also that uh, the affordable housing is obviously let's say somewhere out there and not very close to, to uh, employment uh, places and then indeed people have a maybe a relatively affordable house but you know how do you get to work and how do you pay for that? And especially now, you see that now, of course, more or less enlarged with the energy crisis, uh, where people are really struggling sometimes to, to simply uh, pay for their transportation. Anyone else, uh, please? Um, um, I just, this is Vishali, and I would like to uh, comment on, I would like to ask a question on Corey's comments. Uh, we require our commercial sector to contribute to housing through either building or providing cash in lieu of housing. Does, do you, Corey, do you mean, what do you mean by that? Do you mean by community benefit agreements? When we make an agreement with the developer, that part of the revenue will go towards low cost housing? Do you, is that what you mean? Or is this so, a benefit? Okay, go ahead. Thanks. So we call it our, it, Basically, anytime a commercial business either starts up in BAMP or does a change of use from retail to food and beverage, that type of thing, we have a calculation that determines how many housing units are needed. And sometimes if they're changing that change of use, they actually get a credit on that site. But uh, often they will need to either build the housing units required for that business or it, let's say they're a mom and pop shop and you know like i said earlier land is very unavailable here it's very mm -hmm. expensive to build then they can do it through providing cash in lieu and so that money goes into our community housing reserve that i briefly spoke about earlier that the revenues from our rental apartment is going toward and then that reserve currently it's sort of being held as we look at one of the last uh, developments the town of bamp could potentially be doing uh, from discounted land that we purchased from the federal government. But if you flip through it, it the, the link I have there, it, it sort of lays out exactly how it works, but that's my uh, understanding of it. Thank you, Corey. Um, indeed, it's good to... Are these uh, documents, I mean, it's a question for the organization, but these, these links will be available later on as well. Can people see those, check those things later? Maybe that's a question for Alex. You or... can, yeah, you can save the chat. You can save the chat, yeah, okay. or save whatever link you want and download. Yeah. Yes. Saving okay. chat is better. 
Hilda, is there more you would like to get out of this uh, audience, which is a very broad audience? Uh, no, it's, uh, it is very broad. The conversation has been very interesting, very stimulating and very informative. That's wonderful. We have, um,